Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of Strange Origins. As always, this is your host, Paige Wollstenhume, and I'm excited to get into my research concerning the history of a topic that's a little more complicated than you might realize. From Gaelic mythology to witches to Disney, fairies seem to be everywhere, and they're a lot less nice than you might think. When I was a kid, I had a collection of large books about some of my favorite things in the world, including pirates, wizards, princesses, and dragons. One of my favorite books, though, was the one on fairies. It was titled Fairyopolis, a flower fairy's journal, and it told the story of Cecily Mary Barker, a painter who journaled her experience with fairies during a summer stay at a friend's English cottage. In it was a charming sample of a fairy wing and some sparkly fairy dust and booklets of field guides on fairy trees and fairy rings. It was everything a kid would need to fall head over heels with the idea of fairies. After a little research, I came to realize that, though the artifacts found in the book were obviously fake, the name attached was not. Much to my surprise, I found that Cecily Mary Barker was a real artist who, inspired by the pre-Raphaelite art movement, began creating beautiful watercolor creations. Fortuitously for Cecily, her sister ran a kindergarten out of the back of her Victorian home in 1923, and she would often use the kids as models for her pieces. This is where a lot of images of children as fairies come from nowadays. During the early 20th century, as a side effect of spiritualism, fairies grew in popularity. You could find them everywhere you looked. One event that was a catalyst was the recognition of Australian artist Ida Rentoul Outhwaite by the Queen of England, who used her postcards, which featured fairies, to send notes to friends. There was also Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's newfound fascination with fairies in his literary work, due to his interest in photographs taken by two girls who stated that they played with fairies in their garden. One of the most recognizable catalysts, though, was the publication of Peter Pan by J.M. Barrie, which, of course, featured the beloved Tinkerbell. Barrie even wrote about the birth of fairies in the book, stating that, When the first baby laughed, its laugh broke into a thousand pieces, and they all went skipping about. Even today we feel the effects of that fascination with Fae a century ago. From these stories, one would assume that fairies are pure, sweet creatures, tiny beings surrounded by an iridescent, loving glow. But is that true of the Fae of old? Were they always as beautiful and charming as Disney's Tinkerbell is these days? While, in my mind at least, fairies are simply just tiny human-like creatures with wings, the umbrella under which small creatures are referred to as fairies is surprisingly large. Creatures such as pixies, hobgoblins, leprechauns, banshees, elves, brownies, and even satyrs, gnomes, and dwarves could all be referred to as fairies, technically. This is part of the reason why we refer to really any story that involves magic as a fairy tale. Through my research, though, I found that unlike the sweet, mischievous creatures Disney has found a way to monetize, stories of fairies who interact with humans are usually just a cautionary tale, or a way to deal with devastating realities. Stay tuned after this short message to learn more. Ever found yourself rambling on and on about a topic you're passionate about and thought, I could make a podcast about this, but were unsure of where to start? Well, I'm here to tell you from experience that it's pretty simple when you use Anchor. First of all, it's completely free, so you don't have to spend a dime on distributing your podcast. They also bring sponsors to you, and you can choose which ones you'd like to work with, so you don't have to worry about finding people to pay you to do what you love. Second, it comes in app form, so you can record while traveling, save interviews right onto the app, and easily edit and add free music into your episodes. Anchor distributes everywhere podcasts are published, so even if you have a wide range of people interested in what you have to say, they'll all be able to tune in. Also, Anchor doesn't require minimum listenership in order to earn money for your hard work. So, even if you're growing like I am, you can still make a little side cash. So, if you have an idea and a phone to record your voice, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started.
Welcome back, everyone. Before I can get into how fairy stories usually just end up being cautionary tales, we need to get into where these devilish little creatures came from. Some believe that fairies are simply just the spirits of the dead, which is one of a myriad of explanations for their existence. One tale tells of a man caught by the fairies who found that whenever he looked steadily at a fairy, it appeared as a dead neighbor of his. But to me, it makes much more sense to think that fairies aren't a part of the human race. And seeing as they are speculated to be able to live forever, I think it's a more interesting take to think that they existed far before humans ever did. I think that just about everyone knows that the idea of fairies came from the Celtic part of the world, from areas such as Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. But not everyone knows that they are actually believed to have come from the Irish mythology of Gaelic gods and goddesses who are much less well-known than Greek or even Norse gods and goddesses. Part of the reason they are much less well-known is the fact that their history is much more complicated than any other mythology I've had the chance to read about, spanning many different generations and what are called cycles, or rather, stories of people who fought for and inhabited Ireland. A lot of Gaelic mythology has been lost to time, and a great portion of it was never even put down on paper in the first place. But somewhere in there lies a group of gods and goddesses, referred to as Tuatha de Danann. This translates to mean the folk, or people of the goddess Danu. While it's unclear based on texts whether these people were deities, or just shapeshifters, and not a lot is actually known about Danu herself, they are still considered to be the origin of stories involving fairy people. Reasons for this connection came from the fact that Gaelic gods existed in another realm, much as fairies do, and would often come over to our realm to interact with humans, just as Zeus or Poseidon would do in Greek mythology. But while Zeus and Poseidon's adventures really just resulted in a bunch of demigods walking around Earth, Gaelic gods were more into wars and land grabs. Stories say that when invaders came to Ireland to take over, they escaped underground, or rather, to the realm of fairies. During special festivals, such as Samhain, celebrated on October 31st to November 1st, and Beltane, celebrated on May 1st, measures were taken as a way to help ensure good crops the following year and to keep farm animals from getting sick. A lot of these rituals took place before the advent of modern medicine and advanced farming techniques. As farming was a life or death situation for the working class in Gaelic countries. If crops failed or animals suddenly died, people starved to death. So as a way to appease pagan gods, farmers would light bonfires or leave food or milk on front steps for fairy visitors. To protect dairy production, farmers would also take their cows to the nearest fairy fort, any circular remnant of a building where fairies were believed to gather, to give a small bit of the animal's blood as an offering. The cow's blood was to be poured into the ground with an accompanying prayer for the herd's safety for the coming year. Another reason for these rituals was the belief that, on these days, fairies could more easily cross into our world, and appeasing them would keep them from causing any unnecessary mischief. Superstitions such as these occur quite frequently in the woods and farmlands of Ireland. People are warned to never interfere with paths that fairies take from their homes to sites of traditional significance. Animals are even reported to stay away from fairy paths and circles. It's a pretty regular occurrence that homeowners will move certain parts of a building or leave doors open at night in order to allow fairies safe passage on a fairy path. Builders have also even been warned against using courts in their constructions, as it's considered fairy stone. Failure to test whether a building is built on a fairy path will often lead to sickness, crop failure, or even death based on the experiences of the generations of people who have lived there. One such story tells of a family who had had the misfortune of burying four children, and with a fifth sick as well, were told to move their newly built addition to their house out of the way of a path between two fairy forts. The father did just that, and miraculously the child fully recovered. While researching the history of fairies, I came across some interesting stories that I had previously believed to be unrelated to the topic at hand. I kept coming across stories of witch trials. This is most likely due to the effect that Christianity had on Gaelic mythology. Through the years, stories of fae were passed down orally 
until Christian monks took it upon themselves to record them, taking a few liberties here and there. This is most likely where the idea that fairies were fallen angels or demons originated. In 1597, King James VI of Scotland wrote and published a philosophical dissertation on the history of the supernatural called Demonology. It included subjects such as necromancy, witches, werewolves, and even vampires. It was essentially a letter describing why the public shouldn't mess around with evil practices, and in equal measure why it was okay to persecute witches and sorcerers in Christian terms. This book even included fairies as examples of creatures not to mess around with, stating that they were another version of a demon or demoted angel. By the 16th century, having anything to do with fairies meant that you acted with the use of witchcraft, and essentially consorted with the devil. It makes sense that the French origin of the word fairy, fee, was actually used to describe a woman who was skilled in the art of magic, herbs, or healing. Between 1579 and 1651, a number of lesser-known witch trials took place in Sicily, Italy, which was under Spanish rule at the time. In Sicilian folklore, fairies referred to as Dona de Fuera, or ladies from the outside, would visit Sicilian women and take them to the city of Benevento. These fairies weren't your typical winged creatures, but rather were described as beautiful humans, both male and female, that were dressed in red, black, or white. The strangest thing about them is that they were described to have had round feet, much like the paws of a cat or horse. A group of these fairies would come into Sicily and whisk away women with the sounds of a flute or guitar. Later on, these women would meet these fairies in the woods every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. It's pretty unclear as to what occurred during these meetings, but it is said that they were, quote, instructed to be benevolent creatures, whatever that means. When 65 people were accused of witchcraft because of these incidences, it was stated by members that they actually went to these meetings in a non-corporeal fashion meaning that they used astral projection to travel to the spot. This was similar to another group from Benevento, who called themselves the Good Walkers. This group was said to fight a group of evil witches seeking to ruin crops, but in a non-corporeal fashion or while asleep. Don't worry, I'll do another episode explaining this group, so keep an eye out if you're interested. This would not be the only time that supposed associates of fairies were to be put through trial, though. In 1656, Karen Sven's daughter, a maid in Smalland, Sweden, was put on trial because she claimed that she had had a relationship with a male fairy. It gets even more complicated than that because she also claimed to have had children with this fairy. During her trial, she told the court that she had met a beautiful man in golden clothes on a mountain called Gronskull, or Green Hill. He called himself Alvakungen, King of the Fairies. He gave her gifts, and they danced together on the hill. She recounted having seven children with the creature, and every time she gave birth, he had come and taken the child away to the land of the fairies. She stated that these births had taken place during recurring fits, after which she was very tired. Her fits had been witnessed by many, and Karen's employer testified that he had often heard her searching for her fairy children in the forest. Concluding the trial with the church, They decided that she was not guilty for the sole reason that, quote, Satan had made her insane. The court told her congregation to pray for her, and after her peers gave her a silver cross, the fairy prince didn't visit her again. She was lucky, though. In another case, similar to this one but involving a creature resembling a lake nymph, a mermaid-like woman, a man was put to death for, quote, consorting with the devil. One story that I found fascinating was the belief that ancient arrowheads found in Ireland and England were thought to be used by ancient fairies, believed now to be Neolithic and used by humans who were among the first to begin to farm. People would collect these flint arrowheads and use them as divination or prediction tools. By the people who found these arrowheads, they were often called fairy or elf darts. Mediums or witches would use them to predict certain outcomes by throwing them on the ground in a circular formation and reading the outcomes using spirits from the other side. 
Farmers who found the arrowheads would boil water with them, which they would then give to ailing farm animals in an attempt to heal them. Other people would simply just attach them to their watches for good luck. While the idea of fairies is tantalizing, I understand the belief that they are simply just a social construct, and for keeping travelers on safe roadways out of the way of danger. I think it's also prevalent to mention that without the blessing that is modern medicine, deaths were much more common before the 20th century. Without forms of contraception, the birth rate was high. Women would often give birth to around 8 or 10 children, and that would only be if they didn't die in childbirth themselves. It was almost always guaranteed that at least a few of those children would pass on before the age of five. So fairies were, unsurprisingly, often used as a scapegoat for illnesses such as tuberculosis or birth defects. I guess if you have to watch your children pass on or even be born with deformities that you can't medically explain, the idea that those kids are fairies themselves or that they are in the fairy realm is a comforting notion. It gives people a sense of control who, under those circumstances, didn't have any. But at the same time, it's really quite difficult to state that they are simply just a construct. With a mile-long list of creatures around the world that are classified as fairies, and with cultures and geographies that differ vastly, all claiming their own experiences with the creatures, I can't with full confidence say that fairies don't exist. Just like in the stage production of Peter Pan, I'm gonna have to say it. I do believe in fairies. I do. I do. As my usual time is just about up, I want everyone to know that I realize that I have barely scratched the surface of fairies. There are so many accounts of fairy encounters, writings on the topic and theories of fairies that I haven't gotten into, which is why I will be making a part two to this episode in the near future. I strongly believe, though, that the more research I do on other creatures and other strange incidences, such as aliens, witches, and selkies, the more stories I will have to share with you guys about the origin of fairies. So if you enjoyed this episode and want to learn more, shoot me an email or message me on Instagram so that I know what exactly it is about fairies that you guys are interested in the most. This includes historical incidences or even stories from your own life, so don't be afraid to share. Now as I come to the end of this episode, I want to thank anyone that took the time to listen, and also to thank my sponsor, Anchor.fm, for allowing me to get this podcast out for you all to hear. For anyone that has a story they would like to share, I would absolutely love to be able to hear from you, wherever you are and whoever you are. It would be great to know what about this week's topic interested you, if you have your own experiences with it, or if you have suggestions as to what would make this podcast better. I would also love to be able to read your stories aloud on the podcast so that listeners know that they aren't alone in their experiences. I'm working on building an Instagram page for Strange Origins, so if you like what you hear or you like spooky memes, go give me a follow. Also, if you would like to support this podcast and to help it grow into something bigger, please visit my Patreon page, which is listed in the description of this episode, and where I offer great gifts to those supporting my dream job. And as always, guys... Remember to keep it strange.